the startups are taking the tech compensation model and the tech hiring model for diversity and equity and inclusion. They're not taking the maritime model. And that's probably a very confrontational or something maybe I shouldn't say, but it's important because the difference is, is we are going to start to lose good talent or not be able to even recruit that talent as an industry if we don't step up the way that we talk about our hiring practices or who we are as an organization. Welcome to the Shipping Podcast, where I meet interesting maritime professionals sharing their passion for the shipping industry and their everyday job. I am your host. My name is Lena Gosberg. Hello, Shipping Podcast lovers. Happy New Year! I hope you have enjoyed the holiday season and have had an excellent start to the new year. Wherever you are in the world, whoever you are, thank you for tuning in to listen to the Shipping Podcast. I have had a wonderful conversation about how well the maritime industry matches the tech industry when it comes to attracting the next generation and the talents that we need. I spoke with Caitlin Hardy. She's the Vice President for Programs at Kongsberg Maritime Incorporated. And I'm happy to share this conversation with you in the 179th episode of the Shipping Podcast. Now, put your seatbelts on. This is a challenging conversation if you're used to the old-fashioned view on the maritime industry. Welcome to the Shipping Podcast. Could you please introduce yourself? Thanks so much for having me. My name is Caitlin Hardy, and I'm the VP of Programs for the Americas for Kongsberg Maritime and the head of Kongsberg Underwater Technology, LLC. And you live in Seattle. I do. I'm just north of Seattle. Our office here, we can sometimes see the mountains, and it's a, an amazing place where maritime and tech intersect, and we're seeing more and more of it every day. And what is your background? I grew up here in the Pacific Northwest in the U.S. Um, I grew up on an island right on the Canadian-U.S. border, so I've always been surrounded by the water. I grew up sailing, racing sailboats. It was sort of the only sport I ever had. I was really lucky to grow up in a community-sponsored sailing program. And through that, had a chance to sail all over the U.S. and the world, and it led me to the U.S. Naval Academy, where I studied naval architecture and have a bachelor's in naval architecture. I did a short stint in the Navy, and when I got out, I came over to the civilian side to work for a large U.S. tug tug and barge operator for a naval architecture firm that they had just acquired. And what was really wonderful about that was I got an opportunity to work on their vessels and their designs, as well as supporting other work boats, commercial fishing, fishing vessels in Alaska, salvage jobs, sea lifts, just a little bit of everything. Uh, from there, I made a jump to one of their competitors and shifted from the engineering side, sort of the day-to-day weeds of the calculations, to project management and leading projects from you know start to finish for new vessel construction and just sort of large heavy lift type items. I made a quick jump into cruise, so I've been able to be fortunate to see a lot of different segments over you know the years of my career. Took some time along with work to go back to school and get my master's in business. And during that time, I really struggled with having this huge love for maritime and the water being in my blood, but also feeling like maritime was very stuck. And my husband works in tech. I'm in a very buzzy city for tech. Being in Seattle, we have Amazon, Google, Starbucks, Facebook, all of the big tech companies are here. And for so long, in the back of my mind, I had this fear of Amazon that, you know, to go to Amazon means you work all the time, you have no life, um, things are just crazy. And what I saw was that Maritime was expecting so much more from me than what Amazon or these other tech companies were expecting from my friends. What a project manager in a tech company might do was significantly different than the array of tasks that a PM in Maritime might do. So I took a bit of a step away from sort of traditional maritime and spent a couple of years in two different uh, maritime tech startups. One focused on AI and ML and the other focused on cybersecurity for primarily government applications. And then this past July, I was fortunate enough to join Kongsberg Maritime. And what do you do now? What is your responsibility nowadays? At Kongsberg Maritime, I oversee our programs management organization within the Americas. So what that really means is from the time that sales hands over a project, making sure that we kick everything off in the right way and taking that through uh, the entire execution. 
Here in the U.S., we've worked with the U.S. government for over 30 years, very heavily in our sensors and robotics uh, product center, which is primarily focused on underwater acoustics and marine robotics. Those were two, you know, core expertises that were very new to me. And so it's definitely been a bit of a learning curve, but it's been fascinating to be able to focus on, you know, supporting our large government customers, as well as the different research organizations for mapping the ocean floors, looking at different fisheries, um, as well as, you know, looking at the technology that's moving so rapidly around marine autonomy. Mm. It sounds fascinating to me. I think you might have just... uh gone through the right steps when it comes to AI and it comes to <laughs> remote control things and, and, and all of that. And cybersecurity is also on the map right now. You're in the hot spot in the maritime industry. I, I love the intersection of where maritime and tech meet. And for me, that's what's made the Pacific Northwest, the West Coast of the U.S., such an interesting place right now is, you know, we're in an industry that is largely invisible to the public eye. If you were to visit Seattle right now, you would see the cruise ships and you would see the tugs and barges and tankers and everything else moving through here. But to the general public, you know, especially even those who work in tech who are in these high towers downtown, they don't see that. And so I see a huge opportunity for being able to take the incredible software engineering talents, different tech talent that we have, just the approach to how we get work done, how do we bring in younger workforces and marrying that with maritime to really take things to the next um, the next degree. At Kongsberg, we talk a lot about sustainability. That is core to how we are developing our products. And so for me, I can't imagine being in a better place, at least here within the US, than Seattle to really leverage the ability to get that type of talent. Mm. But does the maritime industry realize that that is what we need? this is the talent that we need. (laughs) I don't think so. (laughs) No, I don't think so either. And I don't know how we can get them to understand that. I think it's changed a little bit because when I started this podcast, like more than six years ago, it was like no one believed in in, um, remote controlled ships. Um, No one thought that it was uh, any of of any importance to maybe think about uh, the next generation, what they were looking for, because everything was going the same as it has done forever and ever. (laughs) I think we're so precious in so many ways in maritime about sort of protecting within our own companies. When I left cruise, I had a really great job. I was doing continuous improvement for four different brands. Um, I found it fascinating, but I had an opportunity to join a young series, a maritime startup. And I think everyone at the cruise company thought I was crazy because here I was leaving this very stable, steady job where we had access to really wonderful technology. But for myself personally, it was being able to push the envelope to the next thing. You know, I would come home every night from grad school and have these conversations with my husband of just sheer frustration of seeing opportunities where we only had to make incremental change, you know, small stepwise change, nothing massive. Um, But what could lead to significant safety improvements, significant cost savings. And it was really hard to get buy-in. And so then you start to look at something like a startup where you're traditionally taking people from outside of the industry And that's, I think, very threatening because in maritime, you know, it's very familial. We build on, you know, our almost genealogy of where we've come from as an industry. And so to see these outsiders sort of being perceived as coming in and telling us, oh, well, I know how to do it better. That's that's, I think, a huge turnoff to the industry at large. I will say, though, COVID seemed to have made a huge impact on the ability for maritime startups to have a voice and to see the value. Um, just on the ability to analyze data both on board and send that data back in small packets, you know, to a shoreside FOC, a fleet operations center. COVID is maybe a positive in COVID is that it's helped accelerate the digitalization on board that we might not have seen for some time afterward. So I think maritime companies are certainly starting to see the value. The number of maritime startups has increased dramatically. There's a really great graphic out there. And, you know, four or five years ago, there were maybe a couple of dozen maritime startups on there. And today that number probably is well over 200. And so I think companies are starting to see ways of interacting with these startups and with these younger you know, tech entrepreneurs to leverage their ideas. I think the real paradigm though will become is maritime, is our current world able to operate in tandem with these startups? Or are we going to continue trying to buy them and 
you know, hoard that information for our own brands and our own companies versus sharing it on a larger level where the overall industry benefits. I think you need it there in a way. Because I've also seen the development when it start, when I started, it was like uh, digitalization, mm, maybe uh, some of the f- <laughs> of the large companies, the forerunners were doing that, thinking, looking at that. But then they they bought the knowledge from outside. They had the consultants for a while. Then they started, as you say, to buy startups and, and take them on board their own companies. But now I see that they are hiring all this Mm-hmm. wizards from the from the tech world into yeah. their companies but as you say we won't get that big change that we all need as an industry the paradigm change until everyone is sharing the same cutting edge knowledge between them exactly and and it's so hard it's you know i i love that we're bringing more software engineers and hardware engineers and technology trained folks into our organizations. But at the same time, when we see this within, you know, say specifically an example would be each operating line trying to develop this technology on their own. That is so cost prohibitive. It's also interesting on the hiring side of, are you able to recruit the best talent if you're only a onesie or a twosie versus a larger organization where someone sees, you know, that they'll have mentors that they'll be able to learn from the next generation um, and such. And so I, it will be interesting to see how things play out over the next year or two. I think we will see significant movement and possibly even consolidation for how, how we look at digitalization. Yeah, but also uh, now it's become a question for the sea level. It didn't start there. It started in the technological uh, department thing and they were felt threatened in a way. And, and they have been, they have been working their whole life to become head of technical department or whatever. And then it's very hard for someone to come and say, well, now it doesn't really matter if you are <laughs> the head of the technical department or if we are something else, because now we're going to work another way. Right. But now it's at the sea level. And also, I think there are so many more people discussing how can we reach the goals that we are setting for ourselves or the IMO is setting for us and so on. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, I used to say to everyone, well, how do you think Apple Uh, how do you think they work with a technical problem? They usually tell everyone, we got this problem. Can anyone out there so right. help us solve it? Sure. And that is what we need to, to reach that point. I keep my fingers crossed because I think that's the way we can do so much more. No, I, I agree. I Maritime is one of the oldest, most traditional industries, right? And clearly we have innovated for thousands and thousands of years. But for the acceleration of where technology is today, we are not innovating as an industry as fast as we have the opportunity to. And like you said, how does that tie back to governmental goals, IMO goals, individual companies, you know, corporate um, sustainability goals? And there's there's a lot of movement that can be done in ways where, you know, information can still be protected so that a company has their differentiating edge, but that we are collectively as an industry moving the needle instead of each trying to do this on our own. Do you see any progress anywhere? Do you see some companies thinking a little bit like what we are discussing now, or or is everyone doing it same old, same old? (laughs) You know, I to go back to maybe the only benefit out of COVID, I have seen the needle move more in the last six to 12 months than my my whole career. For me, what's really exciting is that, you know, virtual work has shown that we can have people staffed throughout the world and that they don't have to come into an office to get things done. And we are able to, I believe, retain better talent, recruit better talent when we can do that. We can get better talent or different talent than we've traditionally had on a diversity, equity, inclusion piece by doing that. And so the changing workforce or the ability to go after workers who traditionally haven't been in maritime, that has an ROI that we haven't even begun to scratch the surface for an industry as. To to go back to the tech piece on its own, I've been so encouraged. I know that the companies I've been fortunate enough to work at, you know, having been very tight in their operations in the past and looking at where they are today, these were companies that I considered forerunners then, but to see the commitments that they're making to sustainability, to see the commitments that they are making to their people, 
um, whether it's in wellness programs, on the sustainability piece, whether it's going to electric, whether it's going to hydrogen, looking at alternative fuels, you know, having emissions targets, you know, going to zero, getting to zero, that's huge. And that's a significantly different conversation than we were having four or five years ago. Um, when I was working for one of the U.S. tug and barge companies and their sister company in container ships, we were doing the first LNG bunker barge in the Americas. It actually would have been the first in the world, but we were the second. And at that time, everyone thought that was the most cutting edge thing that had been done. It was an incredibly complex vessel. The technology, the innovation and the collaboration, I think the collaboration piece is the most key of all. And here at Kongsberg, for me, that was a a driving factor in wanting to join this organization because of, you know, it's hard to innovate by yourself. Even if you come up with the best idea, you have to work with other people to see the value in that and to take that to the next level and to take that forward. And so I think the collaboration that we are now seeing in the industry amongst different working groups and just organically is really exciting and changing things. I'm so happy that you are convincing me that collaboration is not just a buzzword because everyone is talking about collaboration, <laughs> but I want to see some. I want to see the examples that I can tell everyone else about. Where do we see the progress? Where do we see some innovation in the maritime industry? I think a really interesting place that we're seeing innovation in the maritime and in the military space right now is within the U.S. Department of Defense and the U.S. military. Um, over the last, you know, really couple of decades, mil military tends to look very much inward um, and they focus on the prime defense contractors, you know, the Lockheed Martins, the Boeings of the world that they've worked with forever and ever. But what we've seen over the last four or five years is the invention, really the addition of an organization called AFWorks. And AFWorks is a program within the U.S. Air Force, so I'll get to how it's related to maritime in a minute. But on the innovation piece, AFWorks exists to increase the collaboration between the inner and outside service for innovators and entrepreneurs. So they have a small budget, but their goal is to be able to accelerate the procurement cycle, which with military contracts can be really, really lengthy. You know, military contracts, the sales cycle looks so much different. It could be a three to five year long process to get to the point where you're signing. And so where that relates to the maritime world is the military is starting to see the benefit of being scrappy, of adopting, working in an agile, you know, project management method of having these different innovating organizations within DOD. A few other examples are Naval X. So this is the maritime component. Naval X is well over a dozen tech bridges now, so incubators really, that are reaching out to industry within different parts of the United States, looking for entrepreneurs, looking to help grow these seeds and these ideas and bring them back to the U.S. government uh, to build on the different technologies of the future. And so for me, that's really exciting to see the partnerships that are starting to come across from the military, reaching out and asking entrepreneurs of all ages asking universities, what are you working on and how can we progress these things together? It's exciting to see these small contracts being awarded sometimes in less than a day, which is really unheard of when you're dealing with uh, government contracting. On the cyber and software side, because this does tie back to maritime, because as we move to a more autonomous maritime operating field, uh, software becomes more and more important. Within the Air Force, they have a team called Kessel Run, and Kessel Run is what we call a software factory. And this is made of leading software developers who are ensuring that code is really standardized, that software is reviewed. They're, they're building this overall platform for where software can live to ensure that all these different systems and all these different tools and all these different weapons throughout the Air Force are easily working together in the right way. They're able to make sure that they're using the latest and greatest technology. They're able to realize cost savings. They're also able to be this point within the organization to ensure that each team is really using the same tools and that you have consistency across what is a massive organization. On the Navy side of that, we're now seeing this as well with an organization called Black Pearl that is considering themselves not as much of a software factory, but a best practice for how to share what's called DevSecOps in the software development world. So I think the moral of the story is when we see the military starting to reach out and embrace startups, when we see the military embracing Silicon Valley, you know, engaging with VCs and tech stars, 
it's very different than the world that we were in maybe 10 years ago. And I think that will have a significant influence on where the U.S. and other friendlies are able to advance their technologies. So that is collaboration for real, isn't it? It is. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And it's it's collaboration with it's collaboration with players who have never really been invited to the table or thought that they could have a seat at this table, right? And so that on its own accelerates this innovation curve of how we're able to work together. So you mentioned also, I mean, diversity. We we cannot just jump the question of diversity because we're both women and we have also <laughs> met through Vista. We can be a little bit uh, transparent about that. <laughs> I meet so many good people through Vista, so I can say that we have met through Vista as well. What do you think will be the biggest thing to change the, the question of diversity in our industry? Yeah, I I feel like I ask myself this all the time. I am most definitely not an HR person or trained in HR in any way, right? I hear sort of the, the good and the bad I, I see of it. The good is we are seeing more women come into our industry, but it's not enough in my mind. The first example that comes to mind for me this year, a uh, good friend's daughter, they were my sponsor family when I was in university. So somewhere I could go and spend my weekends and do my laundry and they completely adopted me and welcomed me. And, and when I met them, their daughter was you know, a toddler essentially. And she decided to study naval architecture and she graduates with her bachelor's in naval architecture this May. And I could not be more proud. I don't think I did anything particularly special or was talking about naval architecture a lot to convince her in any way. It was just something that she decided on her own. But for me, what was so powerful about that was she just needed one person to expose her to an industry and to show that this thing exists and that there are other women in these types of positions. On the you know more upsetting part for me, what was disappointing when I recently visited her in New Orleans was to find out that the number of women in her class is only three or four, which is similar to what mine was back when I was in university. At least these numbers speak specifically to the U.S. and probably Canada. But if anything, we are seeing the number of women in engineering drop. It's not increasing. And, you know, I would say maritime is probably the same. And so that's a fundamental problem. How do we bring people into this industry? Because if they have an opportunity to see what we do, it's very easy to identify with. I mean, we both had the benefit of growing up at places that were by the water. And, you know, my father worked in maritime. I think I probably was in maritime before I even realized that was going to be my career path. But as far as bringing women into the industry and bringing other minorities and other voices that we traditionally haven't had, I think we need to do a much better job of branding ourselves and talking about what we do. One of the data scientists that I worked with at the first startup on uh, maritime data analytics, when I asked her, she was working for a cancer research organization. It's one of the largest in the West Coast. They are saving thousands and thousands of lives. I asked her, why would you leave that? You were helping so many people. I, I was just dumbfounded really why she would you know, come to this small maritime startup, nothing against them. But her response to me was because she felt she could make a larger impact on the sustainability side of things and reducing emissions throughout the world. And that would save more lives than the work she was doing in cancer research. And it really caused me to pause because That's the lens that we need to be talking about what it is that we do and the sustainability goals that we have. 90% of everything moves by the ocean. How can we frame that to the rest of the world to show what an exciting industry that this is? I was recently in Boston at MIT speaking with a group of students and they were asking me, well, why should we work in maritime? And this was actually the specific group was all female, which for me was very exciting. And I remembered something that had come up when I was doing my MBA at the University of Washington. And that was focus on what skills you're good at. The industry is agnostic. So that's what I did. I kept my small portion of maritime, tried to not lose my subject matter expertise, but I focused on my project management skills and communication and strategy and operations. But for me, I was missing the heart of what gave me that drive for work every day. And I really think, you know, not just millennials, because our oldest millennials are now over 40. They are well entrenched in the workforce. We need to stop talking about millennials and focus on Gen Z. And so as I was speaking with these younger students, they've been told the same thing. Well, just focus on what you're good at. The industry doesn't really matter. And so for me, it was an opportunity to speak with them and say, hey, let's talk about the marine robotics that we are doing in Norway at Kongsberg. And these are the applications it has. Here's how we are trying to map the ocean floor by 2030. 
And I think when we can tell our story and really share as an industry what we are doing, we will be able to pull in a plethora of voices that we've never had. But until we do that, we will continue to struggle to get minorities and to get these different voices. I think we also need to address some of the issues around our culture and that we as an industry need to shift further. In the U.S., we had Midshipman X, who is sexually assaulted at sea. It's a very difficult thing to talk about, but we have to be able to have these conversations. We have to be able to use the words, the actual words to name these things and to show that this is no longer acceptable in our culture. Maybe this is where we were, but as an industry, this is not where we're going. And here's what we're doing to change that. Yeah, I think I think we all have a responsibility to talk about, to acknowledge the problems. And put them on the table. Because as long as we don't acknowledge the problems, Mm -hmm. we will never solve them. And that has been my... I have also read about the midship X-Men and and, and, and terrible, terrible stuff. And we have had the same thing in Sweden. And we have been addressing it. But maybe not everyone wants to acknowledge that there is a problem for women to come into the industry. And as long as we don't realize, as long as we don't acknowledge that, we can't solve it. And and also, I think everyone I have been interviewing, 175 people or something like that, 170, maybe I've done 10 with myself episodes. Um, I've asked them, how did you how did you come in contact with the maritime industry? I think maybe it's a handful that have said. Oh, I was I I was recruited into the industry, or I was amazed by someone who who actually I read a pamphlet or something, which we don't even have anymore. So you can understand how long, how old they right. those people are. But <laughs> so many people say either it was the famous banana leaf, as it was for me. Someone wanted my knowledge for something, and, and oh, it's the maritime <laughs> industry. Okay, fine. And then I got the bug, or they are. Uh, drawn into it by their family. Either they are inheriting a company in the maritime industry or they are one of their parents or both their parents are working in the industry so they get the bug that way with the from from the birth. Okay. <laughs> but I have yeah maybe five people have said, "Oh, I saw this amazing ad for working in the maritime industry and that is what I that actually drew me into it." I mean, Come on, how does how does the tech companies? Yeah, how do we make that? How do we change that? But how does the tech companies in in, in your parts of the world? How do they recruit people? How do they get people interested? Maybe they don't have to because everyone knows how exciting that is. Right, I I think there's multiple pieces that play into this. So tech is still predominantly male, um, but I I think they're doing a much better job of trying to bring in women. It's it's a pipeline problem. But I still feel like in maritime, it's on us to make sure that we're replenishing the pipeline and filling that pipeline. It can't be an excuse to say that someone's not there, so we weren't able to hire them. For me, it's I, I don't buy into that because nothing will ever change if we continue to take the easy answer and say that. I think there is such a immense competition for workers in tech here in the U.S. right now. So I'm, I'm talking specifically to Seattle and Silicon Valley, which are really the two hot spots. For innovation. And a lot of that comes down to compensation packages. Work is not just about your base salary, but I think this is something that Maritime is going to find in the next, I would say between now and the next two years is a really interesting conundrum is, is as more of these startups come in that are very well financed by venture capitalists, these startups are taking the tech compensation model and the tech hiring model for diversity and equity and inclusion. They're not taking the maritime model. And that's probably a very confrontational or something maybe I shouldn't say, but it's important because the difference is, is we are going to start to lose good talent or not be able to even recruit that talent as an industry if we don't step up the way that we talk about our hiring practices or who we are as an organization. For bringing in more women, I think one of the best things that we can do is talk about how are we flexible as an organization? Because we know that women are traditionally the caregivers in their family. I have an 18-month-old son. I'm so grateful for the flexibility I have in a hybrid working model to be able to balance my personal home life with my corporate Kongsberg life. I think about the tradition to always recruit 
people from sea to shore, which sort of blocks out every other competence there is. I don't say that there is anything wrong with the competence you have being a sailor. And I think maybe we need it in more more places than we do today. But traditionally, that has also been a male-dominated job. And and if they are recruited to, to come on shore, all of them, then it's continuing to be a male-dominated industry. I agree. It, it certainly is a challenge because we, as organizations, as maritime organizations, we want to leverage those experiences people have by going to sea. I mean, as a, you know, Kongsberg, number one, we consider ourselves a technology company, but as an OEM, we want to make sure that we have an operator's perspective and voices in the products that we're developing. Um, But for myself personally, I didn't sail. I sailed for fun. I've raced all over the world, but I'm not a mariner. I am trained as an engineer. And so it's a, a different perspective that I bring. How can we ensure that, you know, as you said, we're opening the pipeline really to more minorities being able to enter the workforce quickly? Because otherwise, It will continue to perpetuate. And this might be something that we can't change for 20 or 30 years instead of maybe something that we can change today. One of the things I've been spending a lot of time looking at lately is the language that we use to talk about ourselves as an industry. And you you asked, what is tech doing differently? Pull up a few tech job descriptions and pull up a few maritime job descriptions. In tech, you're going to see what their values are. You're going to see them talking about how they're changing the world. What's buzzy? What are they doing that's different that makes people want to get out of bed every morning versus a lot of maritime job descriptions, which tell you what the job is, but they don't really give you that value add of what are you, what's driving you, what's motivating your team, what's making you want to collaborate with this large group of people that you're going to be working with. And there's this amazing startup in Seattle called Textio to put in a plug for them. And so they use AI to analyze the language in these job descriptions or on companies' websites. And what I found with a lot of maritime job descriptions is they're heavily written for people in baby boomers' age ranges. So how are we supposed to appeal to Gen Z and how are we supposed to appeal to millennials, who is probably who we are intending for these positions to be written for, right, is we're replacing baby boomers who are now starting to retire, but we're not we're not appealing in the right way. We have the best of intentions. We're trying to draw on these people, but we're not coming to them really in their language. And I think that's a really critical piece of this. That's something that's so easy to change, right? The the meaning of a word between generations or between different cultures can be significant if someone thinks that this is a company that they identify with or not. Sorry, I get very passionate about it. Uh, but I get so happy when, when I hear you say all these things because that, those are thoughts that I have been thinking about as well. But um, I don't have any leverage to. You absolutely have leverage, though. I, I mean, just by the nature of this podcast being out there in the ether for young people, for all people to be able to find, it helps tell the story that we haven't really been taking the opportunity to tell as an industry. Thank you. I think you have leverage. I get so much feedback from young people. And I'm not sure that the, that the older people <laughs> that I know <laughs> uh, actually understand and, and realize that that is, that is something valuable. And it should be valuable for them to listen. I think there is a lot of people listening to this podcast anyhow. But I mean, I, I spent the first two years explaining to people what a podcast was. Mm-hmm. I didn't have to explain that to the young people. Yeah. And I didn't uh, I didn't have to tell them how to use their mobile to listen to a podcast. But uh, I've done that for such a long time. It's it's stopped now. I think it's such more mainstream. Yeah, mainstream with with the uh, podcast, but sometimes I, I I want to do more. I want to change the world. How do I do that, <laughs> Caitlin? <laughs> Ah, you and you and me both, my friend. No, it's, you know, I I think other small things that can make a significant impact in hiring is removing names from jobs, removing names from resumes when people are reviewing them. There's a lot of research around to show, you know, if you have a female name and a male name or possibly if it's different cultures, you know, for where someone's coming from, choose people based on their skill and what they're presenting right? If someone's only spending 30 seconds reviewing a resume, there's no need for a name. There's no need for an address to be on there. 
and then have a conversation with them and see if they might be that fit for your organization. And I think people would be pleasantly surprised by, you know, the types of talent that they're able to get or the types of talent that they're starting to bring into their organization that maybe they traditionally haven't had. I do think it's incredibly important though, that everyone is involved in this. You know, we sort of talk about the the older generation, but I have been so fortunate to have so many incredible mentors who had either just retired or were coming up on retirement and were willing to take a chance on me. And so I think the mentorship sponsorship part of this is also critical. We cannot operate in a bubble by ourselves. It's, it's, I feel a duty and a responsibility to help bring people into this industry. I feel a responsibility within my team to make sure that people are being coached and mentored and have opportunities and that those opportunities are in sync with what they personally want out of their life. I think if companies are able to focus a bit more, and this is something else I've really been impressed with Kongsberg, we have a much better chance of retaining that talent. I also think that there are role models and there are, we need to be a little bit more careful about pictures and, and photos and things like that that is shared because mm-hmm. if you, it's still like this if you Google uh, Mariner, you get Popeye as a, as a picture. Oh, certainly. That is so, so far away from what it's like. It's mind blowing. I, when I was early in my career, I was working for a large tug operator as a naval architect. And this is when Cheryl Sandberg's Lean In had first come out. And um, they were doing a collection with Getty Images around portraying women in the workplace. And I was like, oh, this is fantastic. We're moving forward as a planet. And I Googled or I, I did a search to see what was for women in maritime. And in this lovely new collection, women in bikinis on board beautiful classic yachts popped up. And I was horrified and in sort of just my typical style for better, for worse, I fired off an email to Getty Images and lean in and just said, I'm a woman working in maritime. When I'm on board vessels, I'm wearing coveralls and a hard hat and steel toe boots. And, you know, the goal of your collection, this is completely undermining my industry. And I didn't expect to get a response, but they wrote back and they offered to send a Getty photographer to photograph local women in the Pacific Northwest to capture what it means to work in our industry. And I was blown away because they were willing to sort of acknowledge that they were wrong and take the step to better portray. But yes, imagery is so important because, you know, when it comes back to people researching what career they want to have, what job do they want to go into? If they see Popeye or if they see a gal in a bikini, you know, for the young women, that's probably not going to work to show them this is an industry they want to be in. There's a wonderful project going on in Sweden with a female photographer who is on ships and and, uh, taking photos of uh, female uh, mariners. And this will come out, I think, next year. It's been a little bit delayed because of the pandemic, of course, but but I've seen some of the pictures and wow. That's amazing. It's amazing. And it's, it's so important to be able to show what a diverse workplace looks like because, you know, like for my friend's daughter, she was able to see that this could be a, a path forward for herself. And so that's very exciting to know that that collection will be out there. So when I was setting up my website, finally, I could, I could use different icons than just the traditional uh, anchor or, or, you know, the steering wheel or things like that. Right. But in the maritime industry, everyone is using the anchor, you've got the steering wheel, you've got the blue color, it's, it's sort of continues to build our culture the same way. I would love to see, for instance, those pink vessels that everyone is getting upset about. That's a great marketing uh, new thing to think about. Yeah. Of. <laughs> Ships can be pink. <laughs> no, I, I hear what you're saying. We sort of, as an industry, have this default to almost those emojis, right? These This huge oversimplification of our industry where we're still looking at, you know, tall ship wheels and, um, you know, a basic anchor. But as an industry, we are cutting edge. You know, the work that we as an organization are doing with Masterly for the Yara Birkeland, we have a bridge that can be popped on and off of the vessel and swapped out and eventually won't be there at all because that vessel will be autonomous. How are we talking about those things? I, I think that project in particular got a lot of attention, but as an industry, how are we showing that we have changed over the last 10 or 20 or 30 years? Because those icons haven't necessarily changed or the way that we show, you know, in most of our, our logos, 
maritime imagery, as you say. So no, I, I agree. It's it's a branding problem. We as an industry need to do a better job of campaigning for ourselves and you know showing who we are today and what has changed. It's it's challenging, right? Uh, humans by our nature are resistant to change. And so it's being able to show that benefit and I think pe- taking people along in that journey. Um, you know, maybe it will take a couple of the big operating lines out there to start that change so that the others will follow. You know, in in technology, we talk a lot about crossing the chasm and sort of this innovation curve where you have your early adopters. So those are people who are really on the cutting edge, willing to take a risk on anything because they know it might not pan out, but if it does, the benefits are really large. And then we get to this point as we sort of go up in a um, in a curve where we're crossing the chasm where sort of the general public or the general part of the industry has adopted. And I think as an industry, we're very hesitant to get to that crossing the chasm point in how we talk about ourselves because we have been safe to be able to say the messaging we have and it's been our status quo. We, we don't really see a risk to changing the status quo. But for me, I look at it as look at what we're missing out on going back to the feelings of, you know, I started my MBA. I had such a cavalier attitude because our first day they told us, and this was an evening program, you will change jobs at least three times over the next three years. And I was like, I work in maritime. I'm just here to learn about finance and accounting and the basic skills. I don't need all this other stuff that you have. I changed jobs three times. And a lot of that was very different than the traditional maritime model. You know, I I think a lot of branding comes down to getting out there and talking with other organizations that have nothing to do maybe in our minds with maritime. One of the organizations I've been most impressed with over the last four or five years here in my part of the world is called Washington Maritime Blue. They started as an extension of our state. So through the local government, they are now a standalone organization. And when they first started, venture capitalists wouldn't even have conversations with them about maritime startups. But today they have incubated probably at least a couple of dozen companies that have, I think, over 100 million U.S. in backing, right? That those those points getting out there in person are ways to very tangibly begin to change the conversation. How do you see the future for shipping in general? I think this is a really exciting time for shipping. I think the changes that we are going to see, while they might be scary from a a business perspective, just because change is hard and takes time, will do so much to improve our image globally. But just looking at the types of technology that we are able to use, you know, I think so many people fear our seafarers going to lose their jobs. I personally don't think seafarers are going to lose their jobs. I think personally, we're creating tools to make ships safer at sea. We are creating tools to make people safer at sea and ensure that they get back to their families at the end of their hitches. I think we'll see a huge amount in uh, renewable fuels and renewable energy. You know, we're seeing a lot starting to take off on the East Coast of the U.S. and around the world with offshore wind. That will play a huge role in where we as an industry go in the next zero to 10 years. On the autonomy, unmanned, you know, really gain into the nitty gritty of what most people think of the buzziness of tech and maritime, that's going to accelerate rapidly, but it's not going to happen overnight. And so what I mean by that is a lot of the technology that's going into these systems today, we've had for 20 or 30 years. I think the changes that we'll see in our industry will be probably the most meaningful that the current generations of workers have ever seen. When I made the transition to working in LNG, part of what was so exciting to me was that was the most cutting technology at the time. But now that's just such a tiny piece of what we as an industry are able to do. I believe that we're going to be held a lot more accountable um, by just the general populations around the world as more people do learn about our industry, which we should be held accountable and we should want to make that meaningful change. Because where we are for government regulations today is not enough to get us to really those overall goals of where we probably should be as it pertains to climate change. Was that it? I think, actually, let me use one other example. So a lot of people are really scared about what autonomy can mean and how the industry is changing and what that might mean for future jobs. One really good example is situational awareness. Using situational awareness technology today, onboard bridges helps inform the crews that are there. It helps with decision fatigue. It helps with bridge resource management. If you have cameras surrounding your vessel that are able to interpret 
what is going on, it can help prevent so many of the accidents that we have seen over the last many years, and especially over the last two years with COVID, as we know our seafarers are getting more fatigued, either from not having been able to get off of their vessels or by the demands of the job of what it's asking. Who do you think I should uh, interview the next? Because who would you be interested in listening to? I was hoping you would ask. So we've talked a lot about not just technology, but how do we diversify our future workforce? I would talk to Joshua Berger. He's the head of Washington Maritime Blue, and he has a really unique perspective, having worked for our state government, having been the captain of a historic tall ship, but also having taken so many different elements of what does blue technology, what does a blue economy mean? Uh, and I think he would be a fantastic speaker for your audience. Thank you. So what's on your plate for the coming year? What are you now focusing on? Oh, it's so hard to say, right? This morning, it's looking at what active COVID cases we have in our office and with Omicron trying to figure out how we continue to support our customers while also keeping our team and especially our field engineers who are traveling safe. Uh, for our team here, it's a really exciting time as we move more heavily into marine robotics here in the United States and looking at what that technology is able to do. For me, I'm still you know, getting up to speed on what it means to be working at a large OEM and getting comfortable with our, our different product centers. I'm really looking forward to being able to travel again at some point, whenever that is abroad, because I think being able to have face-to-face -face conversations on occasion is certainly very helpful. Uh, but for me, a lot of it comes back to making sure our team is supported, especially in these crazy times, and making sure that our customers have what they need to continue to do their missions and their operations. It's easy to sort of be in the reactive and firefighting mode, and I think a lot of us in maritime really love that. But it's hard to actually get into a good flywheel um, when you're constantly reactive and looking to the future to make sure that you know you're taking your customers' input for what future features that they're going to need so that they can be successful. But I'm really looking forward to seeing as an industry how we continue to pivot, you know, taking each of these pivot points to better ourselves as an industry, taking those opportunities to tell our story. And I'm really looking forward to seeing how startups in the tech world, you know, if we see Amazon start to enter more heavily, we're seeing them chartering their own vessels. How is that going to push us? And instead of looking at these maybe outsiders or perceived outsiders as threats, really taking it as an opportunity to innovate for a better world. I can't wait for to see the same. I can't wait to see the same. Looking forward to seeing that. I will try and find some people who wants to talk about that as well <laughs> on my podcast. Yeah, I, I might have some for you. Thank you for taking the time to speak to me. Thank you, Caitlin. That was very insightful and generous of you. Once again, I know my inbox will fill up with startups who want to become guests on the Shipping Podcast after having listened to this. So maybe I think I should try and find some more venture capitalists or incubators to interview, to which they can turn and get some real help, which they really can't get from me. So now go and spread the word about this episode, folks. And please come up with more ideas of who you want to listen to here. I have a few great people in the pipeline, but I'm always open for suggestions. Until the next time, from me to you, over and out. Thank you for listening to The Shipping Podcast. Don't forget to tell everyone that you meet that there is a shipping podcast available and that they should download it and listen to the maritime professionals who are sharing their passion for the shipping industry. 